So you you'll give me a thumbs up back there when when it's time, or do I just start talking and just you are talking. yeah, <laughs> just continue talking like this. All right, hi everybody. My name's Colin Murphy. You can wave back, it's good, yeah. Um, I'm a uh, nobody at Adobe. Um, I, uh, I, work at, I work in the Creative Cloud web team uh, on some upcoming products. Before that, I was uh, responsible for the infrastructure and developer experience for document clouds, microservices, Adobe Sign, Acrobat, that stuff. Um, I just, I've given this, talk or version of this talk many, many different times. Um, and so I don't have any idea how, how much you guys know about WebAssembly. So does anyone know, what, is anybody totally new to WebAssembly? Like, I, they don't know what they are. Okay. How many people, <laughs> some of you know it very well, I can see. Um, so, uh, and, then, um, and then how many people know about, the, about WASI, running it outside the, that you can run it outside the browser? Okay, a handful of people. So you guys can probably just go to sleep for like five minutes. Um, but yeah, and, and also on the title, it's kind of a provocative title. It, so this is some, these are some use cases in which you can replace Docker with, with WASI. This is not forget about Docker, right? We still have mainframes, you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing ever dies, right? Um, so don't, like, this is not a, Last time I, I gave a talk, somebody came up to me afterwards from Docker and was like, I've heard some of the things you said. And I was like, okay. So it's not adversarial. I'm not going to. Um, now, if you're a Java person, you might get offended. So I'm, I apologize in advance. Um, okay. So um, yeah. And, and also, also apologies if you saw my talk a month ago in Valencia. You're going to see some slides again. And so apologies on that. But it's been a month, and I have a regular day job. So only so much I can do. OK, so uh, this is the challenge to talk about WebAssembly is it's a really big topic, right? So we, you know, Amazon Prime, how do they deliver their, their, their uh, software updates to edge devices, right? OK, they use WebAssembly. How does, you know, we, I'll talk about how, what we do at Adobe, very different. And then WASI, completely different from that. Um, you know, Fastly, Cloudflare, they have, you know, they've got a lot of products built up with WebAssembly. So it's, it's a really big topic. Um, and so it's going to be hard. Uh, it's hard to explain, especially in, uh, in a half hour talk. So, uh, and so we're talking about it from the point of this talk is server side, WebAssembly. So the web is the, uh, the you know, so, so not, not. Is my mic working? Okay. At Adobe right now, we use. We use it in the browser. We use it extensively in the browser. Uh, it's all C++ code that, that, that is the pride and you know, 
the, the pride of Adobe, our C++ code in our creative products. Um, and we run that in WebAssembly uh, in the browser. And we wouldn't be, without WebAssembly, we wouldn't be able to do it at all. And, uh, and we've been really, um, uh, really involved with uh, w, the W3 and uh, Chrome team and the Mozilla team for a long time around WebAssembly. Um, main drivers, and I have nothing to do with that. I don't, I don't know C++ at all. So just don't want to. Um, uh, but it's in, if, if it uses in, um, in scripting. It's really, really tied to the browser. Um, OK. But you know, the, the good thing is that within Adobe, people have a really positive view of WebAssembly. So it's kind of a, as I've tried to make a point of pushing server-side WebAssembly at the company, um, you know, it's been, it's been a positive experience because people have already have a really good um, impression of the technology. Okay, and so, so here, there's, I'm gonna be throwing some terms here. I'm gonna try to define these for you. Um, so we're gonna start with WebAssembly, which started out running in the browser. ASM.js was like kind of the beginning, I think. Um, and it's a computer language. It's, it's the fourth language for the web. Um, it's a binary instruction format and a text format for stack-based runtime is the, is the thing, and it's a W3C standard. Uh, and then we have the WebAssembly system interface. So the idea that we're going to run WebAssembly outside of the browser in a, in a kind of a, op, almost like an operating system. It's an operating system unto itself. Well, WebAssembly and WASI are kind of an operating system unto themselves. And it just, it stands for a system interface. And that's managed by the Bytecode Alliance. So Microsoft, Amazon, lots of people are members of that. Um, and then, uh, then we have an implementation of WASI. It's also managed by the Bytecode Alliance called Wasm Time. Um, that is one implementation of WASI or a server-side WebAssembly. I'm going to kind of talk. They're, they're, I'll be listing some kind of companies and stuff, and they don't all technically use Wasm Time, but it's the same idea. Um, and, and the other thing to think about um, is that WASI and Wasm is it's almost like we're starting back from the beginning of an operating system. So think of like very beginning of Linux, right, which is kind of famous. But just like, hey, what do you, you're, we're really starting right from the beginning, right? So how do we do networking? How do we do file system access? How do we do memory access? That kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's, still, it's still early days in a lot of ways, but, you, but as you'll see, we've, I'll have some use cases that you actually can use today. Um, and then I think the big limitations right now, so multi-threading, there's no multi-threading. There's no outbound networking within WASI. So you can't make a call out. So that's, you know, if you're going to just try to use the uh, S3 API, right, or the DynamoDB API, it's just not going to work, right? Um, and then uh, the other thing is garbage collection has to be completely re-implemented. If you, if, if you have a language that has garbage collection, uh, you're going to have to completely re-implement that for WASI. So it's a challenge. You can't just, it's not like Docker. And so, um, kind of getting there. This is really a talk of, if I'm talk, comparing Docker and WASI, and I'm just going to say WASI, and when I say WASI, just think server-side WebAssembly. Um, you know, it's not 100% it's not accurate. Um, so Docker, right, I think hopefully everybody is fairly familiar how Docker works, right? It's built on a bunch of, of separate Linux technologies to give you a, what looks like a virtual OS, right? But it's not, because it's got the host OS. Um, and uh, you can really, you can just take whatever, if you could run it on Linux, you, so provided you have a, give it enough memory and CPU and you have enough disk space, you can run it in Docker. And so people can do some horrible, horribly inefficient things with that. Um, but you can lift and shift. You can, you can just like, yeah, I have my thing and now it runs in Kubernetes, right? And it takes forever to spin up and, you know, it's impossible to figure out what went wrong, and the logs are difficult sometimes. But but you could you could do that and kind of say I'm done, right? Um, it also has some kind of security implicate uh, some security drawbacks, at least relative to WASI, right? Because it's it's you're you're building it for Linux. It's assuming access to file systems, memory, networking stack, all these kinds of things. Which if you're going to try to run in a highly compliant environment or try an untrusted code, you're, you're kind of you're going, to be in, you're going to have some issues, and you really need to go back to that host-level virtualization. Um, so WASI 
is, as I said, you can think about it like an operating system. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's funny, if you just Google the definitions for these things, you're gonna see it defined completely differently if you go to Wikipedia, if you go to the Bytecode Alliance. So it, it's, a, it's a little, but, but just, I think of it like an operating system. Um, and it's, you know, it's an API or, or, an a, or ABI technically. Uh, but it's really think of it like a virtual machine or a host or an operating system unto itself that is completely uh, segregated, kind of like a browser tab, right? You don't worry about if you have your browser tab, you have uh, your banking app and you know some other app in your browser. You don't worry about it. It's what escaping and going into the other room, right? So it's, this, it's that kind of isolation. Um, okay, so here. Sorry if it's, we're at eight minutes. Still doing the intro, trying to explain things. So I apologize. Hopefully this is useful. If it's not, just be like, crap, you know, like, okay. All right, so, so Rust is the universal language of WebAssembly. So um, I'm, everybody has, there's, there's a bunch of open source projects. I'm actually gonna show them on the next slide. Every single one of them you can get up and running with Rust. Um, and then we kind of, it's, and then from there it's kind of a mixed bag. So C++, I, I kind of made the top row big on purpose. So, um, C++ is, is it our Adobe, we already use C++. Uh, there are already WASI C files, C libs for WASM time. Uh, but you, you know, it's, you're not gonna see every single project have a library in C that you can, you can bring in. Um, then there's TinyGo, which has really come a long way recently. Pretty much can do everything, I think, except for reflection. If, you do, if, if you're a Go language person, which I was because I used to do a lot of Kubernetes. Uh, can't do reflection, for I think, but I think they're working on that. Um, but otherwise, if you have a Go library, you can, you can compile that to Wasm. And then Python, Swift, Ruby. Actually, .NET's really cool because they have garbage collect, they had to do garbage collection. And so you, your, little, your WebAssembly module is gonna have an extra, I think, 30 megabytes. But, but you can run .NET, and they've done a lot of work, and it's been really awesome to see Microsoft doing that. Um, also, Fermion has a really nice uh, page. If you go to Fermion, they've got um, a list of all the languages and kind of what they support and what they don't. So really cool. Um, okay, here are the platforms. Um, so in my, last, in my last talk, all of the demos were done with Wasm Cloud, uh, which is, was just what last year I, I got going, and it was, it was the easiest one to get started with. And, um, and I've worked with that team kind of, every week I kind of meet with them, or you know, um, roughly every week, and uh, we talk about what their roadmap is, and, um, and so they're kind of the farthest along. So I would recommend them, if you're really trying to do some of these examples, uh, and run it in Kubernetes. So they've done a lot of work getting that running in Kubernetes. Uh, the other one I've done a fair amount recently, because I wanted to change up the demos a little bit, Fermion Spin, they don't have a logo, so I just did the Fermion logo. They don't have a spin logo yet, so Rowdy's gotta get somebody on that. Um, but, and then there are others, and there, these are, it's really, these are great products. I have not used the others extensively. Um, uh, and they all kind of have their little niches. So, um, so it, they're not, these are not all trying to compete to do the same thing. So you should read up if you, if, depending on your use case, um, you, should, uh, you should do that. And so, so yeah, this time I'm gonna do my examples with spin. Last time it was Watson Cloud, so sorry if Taylor's here or Liam. All right, uh, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention Watson Cloud a few more times. Um, okay, first example, this is, this is I think what you're all here for, like just replace Docker. <laughs> so, um, so, so uh, and I did. So I, if, I, I kinda don't wanna repeat myself too much because I went through this in depth in my talk last month, KubeCon Europe, but um, I, I wanted to just to come at it from a really high level, why Docker can be bad, right? Especially with Java. So Java, it's unfair, right? This is like, you know, bear baiting or something. It's, it's like, you're gonna compare WebAssembly to Java, right? That's, that's an easy target. Um, so anyway, uh, yes I am, but you know why? Because that's what we run at Adobe. So it's like incredibly unfair and incredibly realistic. So if you just pull down Oracle, you know, Oracle Java 8, or whatever. Or Java 11, I think they, they put a seven in there, I don't know why, it's Java 11, you pull down the latest Java 11 from Oracle Docker, and then you scan it with something, with one of the scanning tools. I did, it was JFrog Artifactory. 
672 uh, vulnerabilities. So just, and if you have FedRAMP, right, every single one of those you're going to have to track and talk about just for one Docker image. And if you're actually running at scale and running a real product in FedRAMP, you're going to have a lot more than 672 CVEs because you're going to be running hundreds of images, right? So that's bad, right? What else does it need? This, I'm gonna, uh, my example uses the very smallest actual Adobe Sign microservice. And the smallest you can get to, the smallest we have is a three gigabyte, three gigabyte heap. That's as low as we go. Uh, the artifact itself comes in at 296 megab megabytes, which is actually pretty small. And again, like we have ones that are way more than that. Um, and it takes 100 seconds to start up. So it's, you basically, it's not suitable for a functions and service application. You're just going to have this thing running. You're going to have this thing running in all your stage environments, all your production environments, your dev environments. It's just going to be running all the time. We compare that with if you were to rewrite it, which I did. I rewrote, the, uh, rewrote it in Rust, and I ran it. I, can, I compiled it to Wasm time. Um, I'm not going to get, I mean, so you're going to have library vulnerabilities, right? So if you use some sort of a library vulnerability tool, you're not, you know, you still have that. But you're not going to have any OS vulnerabilities because there's not really an OS or there's a pseudo OS. Um, it's just going to use enough heap to process. So the example is a background removal of an image. And it's just going to use enough memory to load that image into memory and then whatever the code is. So it's as, as small as you can get, theoretically, on uh, on heap, and it's written in Rust, so you know you, you have a very fine distinction in Rust between what's on the heap, what's on the stack. Um, the artifact itself is three megabytes, and I don't think I even optimized it. Um, and it starts up in, I think it actually starts up in microseconds, but I think the official line is milliseconds, but it's really microseconds, um, hundreds of microseconds to single-digit milliseconds. So it's it's a functions of, it's a functions of service capable thing. Now. So now it will run. It'll come up, it'll execute, uh, and then it'll, it'll finish up. Um, OK, so let's I'm going to now exit, and we'll do a demo. It's, I'm, it's, it's really chicken. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm really. <laughs> Last time I did a video. This time I'll do it live. But um, well, first off, I'll show the code. So, um, I, so the. Uh, this second line up here, can anybody see in the back? I can make it bigger. Make it bigger. All right. OK. Bigger. Bigger. OK. How are we doing? OK. So this is the spin example. So there's a, just a few little idiosyncrasies between the implementations. Um, so the second line here, I rewrote, I rewrote the, the core business logic of the Adobe Sign Up uh, microservice to remove a background. Really, this is like the most micro of microservices. Um, and I, you know, I pull in some Rust libraries, and I had to pull in this is this one's for spin. So I pulled in the spin SDK. If I it, the Wasm Cloud version, I pull in the Wasm some Wasm Cloud libraries, and they don't use anyhow result. But that's pretty much the only difference. Um, I just I, I load in I load in the image. It's really basic. <laughs> the whole point is it's it's easy. Um, I, I I take an image. I run it through. Uh, I run it through here. I run it through the background removal, and then I. We basically just send back some HTML. So it's, it's dumb. Uh, but, it's, but it's easy. And, and we, this would actually be the application. So, uh, so here we go to Postman. Oh, sorry. Uh, OK. All right, so. Um, Hold on. Make sure I'm in the right directory. I'm not in the right directory. So <laughs> good. <laughs> I guess better than it just fit falling on its face. Um, OK, good. Spin up. All right. So even, even with the most dead simple of demos, I still screw it up. Um, OK, so I'm just going to 3,000. Uh, I'm going to uh, pick an image. It's. Uh, so this is like the one we always use. So don't read into this. But uh, we use uh, this image, this signature, and we remove the background from it. It's good because it's got an O, and like it's, you know your contour tracing has to work. Um, so yeah. So I'm going to pull that in, and I'm going to send it 3,000, 
and I'm going to get back the image with the background removed. And so, oh yeah, I, nobody clapped last time. Okay. I think it's because I kept doing it because I did it on like Fastly and I did it in the oh I didn't do it in the browser I meant to do it in the browser uh, I did it in, I did I did it with like Wasm Cloud and so people are just seeing it over and over again where then they're probably like um, but uh, but anyway so there it is uh, 25 milliseconds uh, which is roughly the same as Java right if a Java is already hot and running you know it's it's pretty good I mean it's just it's just expensive and wasteful um, uh, it's a, I think this is actually Sometimes a little faster, um, but it it in that time, right? It started up, it pulled in the image, it ran a fairly computationally intensive series of algorithms, and then it gave me back the image, all in 25 milliseconds. Um, so so really powerful stuff, and that's so it's a great stateless microservice. If you have if something it doesn't have to talk to anything else, it just runs a job. You give it something, and it gives you something back. Um, it, we are we are definitely now. The future is now. Um, so, okay. So that's that's the stateless server. That's that's the big like replacing Docker. Yes. It. So. You mean like in terms of performance and artifact size and all that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. So it would be close. It's not as good. And it would have all those vulnerability issues. And you couldn't run it on the edge compute. And you couldn't run it on like little devices and things like that. Because um, Docker just needs a lot. It needs a Linux OS. Oh, OK. So you're saying like not Docker. Well, this, isn't, yeah. this isn't machine code versus WASM. It's, Web assembly. There's a lot of it's it's a container versus a container. So yeah, like if you had an optimized system and you built Rust for your MIPS whatever thing and you ran it natively on, you know, you know like a real time OS, then yes, there's like nothing that's going to beat that. But but this is a container versus container comparison. And we we like Docker. If it weren't for the fact that there was something alluring and capable about a container, would not be, you know, you can do things with containers you can't just do with running machine code. Um, so, natively. So yeah. So so you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you specify the amount of memory and CPU your your Wasm application is allowed to have? Um. So there are limits depending on the system you're running it on. Oh, sure. Um. Can you? I don't. Well, you know, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. So it depends on the orchestration your system you're using, and they would have to implement it. So this is just pure, well, this was spin, yeah, yeah. Uh, which would be typically orchestrated with um, HashiCorp Nomad. Uh, and I think HashiCorp has, can set those kinds of things, but that's a Nomad kind of question. Um, so, and I'm not, I don't know anything about Nomad, or beyond the basics of running stuff. But great questions. Um, all right. So, so. It gets a little tricky once you want to start, like you know, calling a database or pushing to S3. Um, if we have time, uh, I could go over this a little bit and some of the newer stuff that's happening. But it's going to be not going to really be in the spirit of the talk because it's it's fairly technical, uh, and and I also, you know, I'm just kind of a user. Um, but uh, there is with Wasm Cloud, we have uh, the ability. To, I'm using we kind of weird, like we all of us. I'm not part of Watson Cloud. Um, have the ability to push to S3, um, uh, and you know they have a MySQL and a Redis. Uh, they have a different kind of a different model. That stuff that stuff is not implemented in Wasm, but it connects nicely through NATs to your Wasm, and you can talk to those things. Um, I think I think everyone's got that plan in the works because it's clearly a problem, right? If we're actually going to start using this for real, we have to be able to talk to things. We have to be able to make out to calls. And this is really implemented on a platform by platform basis, although there's some cool stuff that can kind of be in common that they can all use. Um, OK. Um, and this one is really particular to Adobe, C++. I don't, how many people here would want to run C++ server side? OK, so at Adobe, there'd be hands raised. because. So right, so this is why 
I was like, I almost hesitated putting, there, putting this in. Um, but, you know, Adobe needs it. So the way we do this now, so, so we started out, we're like, oh, we're just going to run C++. And, you know, we'll, we'll get some sort of C++ web server. And then we'll just run it. And it doesn't work at all. It didn't work at all. And we had, like, some really some genius C++ programmers. Because um, uh, you'd have memory leaks. You'd have crashes. The multi-threading and the, the multi-processing was, like, very difficult to debug, especially the thing's just up and running, right? Um, and, uh, and so what they said was, well, we'll run a Java web server, and then we'll use JNI, J uh, Java Native Interface, to, uh, to spin up C++ workers, right? And so, you know, this is just... Not great. It's got you kind of have all the all the worst of Java, and you have kind of in order to make C++ work. But now, right now, we compile C++ directly to WebAssembly, and we use one of these orchestration platforms, and now we can just run C++. Um, so yeah. So for whatever that's worth. All right. Uh, this one's actually cool, and I'm hopefully most of you, if you have, if you're in the web server world, if you're in the web products world. This is actually something really important. This is really important to us, um, and it's collaborative editing. So, uh, and, and also notice I took away Docker because Docker doesn't run. Docker doesn't run in people's browsers. Docker doesn't run, at least not yet, in edge compute. Um, so, uh, and right now it's only it's Fastly in Cloudflare, but I think we're going to get there. So it's an open source talk. Although Fastly does use Wasm time, so it, it's it's like. It'd be like saying, like, well, don't talk about AWS to run like, your code. It's like, well, OK. But Fastly is using open source products, and they run it. So I kind of have to include them. Um, and, so, and also, Edge is tricky, because it means a thousand different things. So I, I mean Edge Compute. I mean Content Delivery Network Edge Compute. Um, and, uh, and then Data Center, just whatever. You know, like, hey, it's in AWS. It's your private data center or whatever, wherever your VMs run. Um, OK, but, but the big idea here is now we ha can completely, we have this new tool in how we do web applications. And it, and it fundamentally transforms how we think about things. Now the idea that we can have something and run it in all three places is now more compelling, because we have three different places to run it. And also, by the way, like the whole distinction thing is eventually going to go away, right? Um, but so, so anyway, so we want to take advantage of all these kind of the, the, the uh, Take advantage of the of what's of the strengths of the various platforms. So, uh, the the problem statement, right, is we want to coordinate people's browser sessions so they can see what other people are doing on a canvas, so editing a document, something like that. Well, it ha if if it has to go all the way back to a data center, halfway around the world sometimes, then that's going to be not a great experience, right? If especially if it has to spin up a worker. And if that worker's written in, you know, Java, and it's going to, you know, the time, it's going to be kind of expensive for us to do, and it's going to be hard to isolate everybody's sessions in a way that they that somebody couldn't, you know, get into somebody else's browser session, um, and uh, and the experience, we're going to have to do a lot of like heavy computation to see like whose whose edit should show up when, right? Because it's because of this high latency. Um, so the, the kind of the this is like the best use case for edge compute is is we have all of these changes to the canvas we call them deltas, and we have that all happening um, at the edge, and and there are products around this that you can look up um, that are offered by these CDNs, um, and so it's cheap because networking is cheap at the edge, it's low latency, and then uh, and it, so every the customer experience is really good. And then we don't have to have a pipe of megabytes of changes from every single user all the way to the data center, which is going to get really expensive if you break into tens of millions of users. So we actually just kind of batch it us up at the edge and just send you know, occasional snapshots, occasional batching of deltas back to the data center so it saves. So the customer experience is better. We save money. It's great. So uh, this is an idea. This is. Um, something that's out there. Um, but yeah, so that, that's really compelling. And uh, I'm really excited about that, uh, the possibility of this. I think I got everything here. 
Oh, and storage is inexpensive in the data center relative to the edge. Uh, OK. All right, so this is, the, uh, this is the other one that's really compelling for me, um, machine learning. Um, so you may not realize, I, if you use Adobe products, there's a lot of machine learning. We've made a heavy investment in machine learning over the last six, seven years. Um, and so anytime in a Photoshop, a filter, edge detection, lasso tool, all these kinds of things, or Acrobat, and so this is, you know, that's, those are all machine learning models. We have lots of little machine learning models. This is, this is kind of the, the classic one for me, because I came from Document Cloud, um, is if you have the Acrobat phone app, you know, Android or iOS, there's this, uh, there's a teardrop, kind of. Like, and if you click that, it's going to rearrange the PDF so that it shows up nicely on your phone. Um, and this isn't a great example, but it's nice and generic, so that's what I used. Uh, so you can see, like, oh, this image that was up to the right, I put it in the center. I make the font bigger. Um, but it can do a lot more than that. It's actually pretty compelling. But the problem is, the problem is that most people, well, not most, but many people around the world, uh, and most people in certain places around the world, their phones can't do it. And, uh, and they're always going to have this kind of significant percentage of the total addressable market that can't do the, what you, your app wants to do. And so the answer right now would be to, well, we'll run that on the server side. And you know, so it'll go halfway around the world and then come back. And, uh, and that's, that's not great. But we can actually run this stuff we can run this stuff on the edge, um, then it's you know then we can have a consistent experience for everybody and a consistent low latency experience that doesn't need a lot of requirements from the from the user. Um, okay, so uh, so here's the like it's kind of similar to the last one, and some of the words are the same, but it's different because we're talking about machine learning. So. We, in the browser, we want, if we could, all things being equal, we want stuff to run in the browser. We don't pay anything to run something in somebody's browser, right? Um, other than, you know, CDN cost to down, for them to download it. But that downloading time is, is significant. People don't like to open up a web page and have it take five minutes for something to show up, right? Um, so we can't, our total amount of memory that we want to pack into the browser we, we, we don't, we, you know, we don't want to put too much into that browser. So, uh, so it's, yeah, high compute, but kind of our space, total space is limited. Edge compute is, is n where it fits in is if we have a lot of models that are fairly small um, that run single-threaded nicely, um, and, uh, but you have a lot of them, so you can't, if you combine them all, you can't download them into somebody's browser. But you can run them in a pretty, pretty well, low latency environment, execute, and, uh, and it's, it's a great, great place to do that. And then you have, still have the data center for you know, GPU, things that are really heavy, things that need GPUs to run. That model inference still have it there. But once again, it's an expensive network, and it's not a great user experience, depending on where they are. Uh, OK, so now demo again. If anyone's still with me, I'm going to demo again, and I'm going to do the right, the correct tab this time. Okay, and I'm going to use the. I'm going to put Grace Hopper in here, and so oh sorry, I didn't even explain what this model's going to do. <laughs> sorry, what this model's going to do is part of the content authenticity initiative, so it's going to fingerprint. <clears throat> It's going to fingerprint the image. Excuse me. So if somebody, whatever, made Grace Hopper look different, we'd know. Um, so here's the code that it's. Uh, this uses the tracked Rust library. Do I have to make this bigger? Let me make it bigger. Okay. Uses the tracked Rust library, and uh, it's really just using the tracked Rust library. There's nothing super special here. <coughs> I load up the model. It actually is kind of significant. So this model load time is not awesome, um, especially on like edge compute. Um, I mean, we're talking, it's milliseconds, but it's like two thirds of the time. Um, <clears throat> so we are loading in this model. We are optimizing and making it runnable. And then we get passed from the HTTP, we get an image, and then we run the inference on the image. Really basic, really basic. Um, 
Oh, and by the way, I did this for Wasm Cloud last time. Both, both examples work with Wasm Cloud. This time it's going to be spin. Duh. All right. And I'm running it already. So here we go. I already loaded it. I loaded the image ahead of time. So, OK, and this is going to spit out a bunch of numbers, hopefully. OK, yeah, there we go. So here's a big vector. And that's the content. To, yeah, but a machine learning model ran. So it spun up ran, and ran, and it took about a second. It's good. It's good depending on what, you know, how it works in the workflow. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely better than sending it halfway around the world and coming back. Is this image is too big, actually, to run in a browser. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the uh, machine learning model is too large. It's 100 megabytes. So yeah, so that's, that's that demo. So. OK. All right. So, uh, so OK, so that's that, where were we? Half hour in? Or we have, we have six minutes left. We can do Q&A, or I can do a brief overview of how the component model probably helps. Well, yes? So you use, it, you use, um, you use an orchestrator. So, um, so you use one of these guys. Well, so actually, that's a great topic. Um, we, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Crustlet. OK, so there was this thing, Crustlet, Deus Labs at Microsoft. Some people here were part of that team. Um, so so they, that, was, that was something they tried to do, was like, well, we're going to just run, we're just going to run WebAssembly inside of Kubernetes. It's just another container. We're just going to have Kubernetes orchestrate it. And it didn't really, it, it's a fine project. You can still find it and run it, but there's, there's, it's just too different. WebAssembly, WASI containers are just too different from Docker. And there's just a lot in Kubernetes assumptions around running a Docker container, some sort of run C, whatever, runtime. Um, and you know, it, like part of it is just, well, this thing starts up in microseconds, and a Docker container spins up in milliseconds. It, it, like one of these Docker containers could, one of these WASIs could start up, do its thing, and shut down before Kubernetes even knows it ran. Um, that's part of it. But there's just, there's just a lot of assumptions, and, and, and uh, it just didn't, doesn't really work. So, so you can run. So Wasm Cloud, my demo last time, I actually ran Wasm Cloud within Kubernetes, um, and that uh, Wasm Cloud has some stuff that will kind of publish stuff to Kubernetes, make pseudo services, and route the traffic to the actors. Um, and, uh, and so you can. And, so we, and I did that in the demo last time. Um, but so you can play with Kubernetes. Um, actually, Nomad is much, has been found to be much more useful with WASI um, for reasons that I, not, I mean, there are reasons, and I've heard them spoken, but I, don't, I haven't dug in into them. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, it was, so, no, there, there are efforts, so it wouldn't be in the, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't think of how you would get it into the JVM. You could take Java, you could do what .NET did, and, and break out that garbage collection, rewrite the garbage collection for WASI, because it's really just like an OS. Um, in a way, the kind of a Java VM is an OS, kind of. Um, and, uh, and then have Java, like with the Grail VM, compile that to WASI. Um, they, have, they are doing work on browser, Java to browser WASMs. They're not working on Java to WASI, Oracle, at this time. Does that answer your question? OK. We've got three minutes left. More questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm sorry. I have to repeat the question so people can. Um, and so the first, sorry, for the first question, it was, why not Kubernetes? The second question is, can we put it in the JVM? The third question is, is there an open source standardization trying to solve these problems communally? And yes, there is. It's just that's a, 
if you build your own platform, you can kind of fill in the gaps. But yeah, I think, I think all these platforms are hoping, and they are, most, at least most of them attend the, you know, many of them attend the, the, the standards committees and trying to get the standards going. And there has been progress, it's just, it's just that's always gonna be slower. And so if you're gonna make a commercial product now, you're gonna fill in the gaps. But yeah, yes. Yeah, so there's something called Wasmer. So, oh, sorry, the question was, if you had a server, a C++ server, and then you wanted to run Wasms within it, how would you do that? And so there's a, there's a project called Wasmer, and it's been written in a number of languages where you can basically embed Wasm. So Wasm, you know, it's a compile target, it's like assembly, but you can write a wa you could write just Wasm, just like you can write assembly, and that gets turned into bytecode. You can write Wasm, and it gets run by a, wa wa by a the, the stack machine, or sorry, the VM, for lack of a better term. Um, so, so yeah, so Wasmer, and they've got a bunch of languages supported where you can just kind of, you know, quote out some some Wasm if you want it, and just or bring it in as a string and then run it. So I think there's, I'm pretty sure there's C++. There's Java. There's Python. There's uh, Perl and or whatever. There's there's everything. Um, Wasmer, so that's different. So that's so right. So sometimes you might get confused if you if you Google Wasm in a lang you know a given language, you'll Wasmer Wasmer will come up, but that's different because that's running Wasm inside a different runtime. It's not running that. It's not compiling that language into Wasm into a WebAssembly. So that's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, I, I didn't because it's a hard, it's hard to compare because I, I think, because I was focusing on running on the edge and so there's nothing to compare it to. It's really the only, only game in town. Um, but yeah, I, I could have, I mean, I could have taken a, and the, the other thing too is like, well, what's my reference? Am I referencing you know, a, a 64 core, you know, monster that was like two GPUs or am I, so it's, it's going to be slower. It's, you know, you're running this thing basically on a Raspberry Pi. So yeah, it's going to be slower um, than that. Um, but no, I, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, it's really like, it's more just like, here's the number, is it good enough? You know, kind of case. Yeah. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Oh, yeah, one last one. Requirements to run WASI? Right, right. So or yeah, so it, it it runs on like on pretty much every microarchitecture out there, um, and it's it's running. It's kind of the whole idea is to for it to run native like at near native speeds, and so yeah, it's it's really widely widely supported, and that's because browsers have to be widely widely supported. So that, I, I don't know if I repeated the question. I was like, is it you know what platforms is it supported on? Pretty much everything. All right. Awesome, that was really good. Thank you for clapping.
canonical. Oh, that's better with the microphone, isn't it? Let me try to do that again. Um, hello, I'm Stefan Greber. I work as the project leader for LexD at Canonical. And today I'm going to be talking around um, running very small clouds, either for private use or for whatever your, your company might be looking into doing. All right. So, a bit of history. How did I get there? Well, um, I've been self-hosting my stuff for a little while now. Um, that's my domain registration. I got it in 2003. And I've been self-hosting a, a whole load of different services over the years. I, cannot, you know, I started doing that in college pretty much. I was doing a bit of websites, email servers, some game servers, that kind of stuff. Uh, web hosting for friends and family. Um, and eventually turning that into hosting for like open source services and doing more and more open source at the time. I started doing it on this pretty much. Um, that's effectively Pentium 1, 100 megahertz or so. Uh, that was just sitting at my parents' place. And I was doing a good enough job back then, really, um, to, to host all of that stuff. Then I you know, got a bit more ambitious. I uh, needed to, to have a lot more um, things hosted. So moved on to mostly renting uh, dedicated services from a variety of providers. A um, bunch of those are mostly European-centric. That's where I lived at the time. Uh, and I kind of finished uh, doing that uh, using mostly OVH servers in 